What a good God we serve. What a great God we serve. He's a wonderful Savior. He's our lover. And it's good to walk with the Lord than for us to walk alone. It's always good for us to understand Him daily better than trying to understand ourselves. We try to understand ourselves and we miss out on the wisdom of God and how we could walk in the wisdom of God. God wants us to walk in His wisdom, not in our own understanding. You know, we try to understand too much about the present happenings, but then we don't realize how much of truth He is to us and how we can work things out for us so easily and uh, help us walk this walk without no frustration. You know, God wants us to be free from frustration. You know, some people are living a life and uh, they're frustrated all their lives. They kind of think, well, things are not to do, doing too good and they don't see changes taking place in their life. They think, well, everything seems to be the same and nothing, really move, nothing is really moving. But, uh, but the Bible says that he's in us working the good work of God. He's working the work of grace in our lives. He's always at work. His word is working. It's a, it's a working word that we are believing in. And uh, there is nothing for us to live uh, without him. We can do nothing. You know, the only thing we feel we are so frustrated about things is because we don't believe what he has accomplished for us and what he has done for us. So, let's go to the book of uh, Galatians. You know, we... God wants us to be free from frustration, from anxiety, from worry, from fears, from trying to achieve things by our own strength, by trying to bring this self-contentment, by trying to please people and live the most miserable life. God wants us to be free. It's, it's hard for us to live this life of frustration and also walk in love. It's hard for us to live this life of freedom with, with uh, fears and anxieties in us. So that's the reason he wants us to be totally free so that we would enjoy the goodness of God. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and who gave him, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. When you frustrate the grace of God, you are the most miserable person. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness cometh by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Christ is dead in vain. It's Christ who died and made everything lively in our life. We had no life at all. It's Christ who died for us and who made everything beautiful in our lives. That's the reason I do not frustrate or put pressure on the grace of God or try to think that the grace of God means nothing. It's only by my understanding I live, or it's, it's by my righteousness, or it is my, my good deeds. It is by me trying to be something. I do not frustrate the grace of God. You know, many Christians who are living a life in anxiety and worry and care, not realizing that they are only frustrating the grace of God, instead of trying to live the life of freedom that Christ has given us. If Christ did not die, then our life is in vain. Go with me to the book of <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, God wants our minds to be free. You know, if our minds are uh, entangled with the things that are happening around and, and we try to do things by our own strength, then, then it's, it's hard for Christ to manifest through us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 
And verse 16 onwards, verse 16 onwards, for if the dead rise not, then Christ, then is Christ, uh, then is not Christ raised. If the dead don't rise, if the dead don't rise, then Christ has not risen. He is not risen. Now, the dead can be seen in two different ways. Number one is when you die physically, you are risen to be in his presence. That's how we understand the scripture when we see it. But at the same time, we got to see that we were dead in sin. When Christ came to us, we were alive and our nature died. And we were resurrected. Now we are resurrected beings right now. Waters of baptism refers to your dead nature that has been that has been baptized or that's been immersed or buried. That word baptism means baptizo. We don't know much of a Greek, but still it simply means a complete immersion, not just a sprinkling. You don't, you don't bury a person with a little bit of uh, sand on the person and have his hands coming out and his feet being all over. And then you begin to wonder, man, this guy is dead, but then still he's not buried right. It's not a good, good job of burial. I mean, they, they make sure that the man is fully buried. You don't see the corpse. You don't see anything of that person, right? So that's how when we die. So if Christ, if the dead rise not, if we don't have a resurrected life, then Christ was not risen. If we don't have a resurrected life, if we don't have the life that Christ has given us now, then we really don't believe that he has risen. But thank God we truly believe that he's risen. As much as he's risen, we are risen with him. As much as he's risen, we are risen with him. Verse 17, Christ, if Christ be not, now the question here is, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and you are yet in your sins. Now the question is, Christ, was Christ risen? Was Christ risen? Because it says if Christ did not rise, then our preaching is in vain. Maybe we should go a few scriptures above. Let's go and see a few more scriptures. Right? We'll see a few more scriptures. Verse 12, verse 12 onwards. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? How do some say that there was no resurrection of the dead if Christ did not rise? Some people say, well, your sins are forgiven. Now, that's a very strong statement which every Christian believe. But you are not only, your, your sins are not forgiven only. You are resurrected to be living like Christ who is resurrected now. You are resurrected to be living the life of Christ. As he is, so are you in this world. So if some now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead and how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. Some people say there is no resurrection and some people believe it. You can see there are so many Christians who have no, no idea at all about the resurrection of Jesus. They have no idea at all about the resurrection of Jesus. They don't talk about the resurrection of Jesus. They don't live the resurrected life. They just think, well, there was a good old days, there was a man called Jesus who died and who rose again, but that's all. But then we are living the resurrected life now. We are living the resurrected life. As he has been risen from the dead, so are we. Hold on to this scripture. Hold on to this scripture because you don't want to be living a frustrated life all your days. You don't want to be living the life that has no meaning. The people who, who have no meaning for life, 
is those who do not believe that Jesus rose again. Even the resurrection day, they just magnify the Easter eggs and all the other celebrations, but that has no relevance at all to scriptures. All kinds of Easter bunnies and all kinds of things, they just make everything so fancy, but they don't even realize that resurrection means everything. Jesus rose again. That's the greatest revelation that we receive by which we get saved. How do you get saved? The Bible says, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what you believe. That's, that's the foundation of a Christian. Salvation does not come by confessing our sins. Whoever told us that we just got to keep confessing our sins all the time? How, how many sins can we confess? For instance, imagine from your childhood, from your birth, can you remember the sins that you committed? And every time you remember them and you keep committing, you, commi you confess it. You keep confessing your sins. You keep confessing your sins. The more you confess your sin, you, you still feel that you're a sinner because there is so much inside of you. But salvation is not by confessing your sins. Salvation never came to us by confessing our sins. Hold on to this scripture once again. We'll see another scripture from the book of John chapter John chapter 10 and verse number 9. If thou, I'm sorry, Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, or you confess. We are talking about Jesus who is Lord. So I confess Jesus Lord, or I confess the Lord Jesus. I confess the Lord Jesus, the same Lord Jesus who was crucified. The message of the church in the book of Acts was the resurrected Christ. The resurrected Christ. Right? So, with your mouth you confess, Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe with thine heart that God raised Jesus, or God hath raised him, or Jesus, from the dead. Right? You believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you shall be saved. So, where is the confession of sins coming? I got to keep confessing my sins. I got to keep confessing my sins. I got to keep confessing my sins, because over and over again, the more you confess your sins, the more you live in condemnation. You don't confess your sins to receive salvation. Okay, let's go to the early church, the preaching of the early church. And the book of Acts chapter 2, we find that Peter, he started preaching with the, with the leaven. And they started preaching and how, this is how the preaching went from in chapter 2. And verse, we'll read a few verses. We'll read verse 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, referring to the prophets of old, or maybe David also, that his soul was not left in hell. His soul was not left in hell. Whose soul? Jesus. He couldn't be kept in hell because it was impossible for hell, uh, for hell to hold him back. Neither his flesh see corruption. It was impossible. This Jesus had God raised. This Jesus had God raised up. For we are all witnesses. That is the witness that we have. The Jesus who was crucified is now resurrected. When you, when you know the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not only on the resurrection day, you got to know all the days of your life because you're supposed to be living a resurrected life. If Jesus did not rise, our faith is in vain. Our, we are still in our sins. We read those scriptures, right? This Jesus who was raised up from the dead, who was raised, therefore we are all witnesses, including every one of us, even in this generation. Therefore, being, 
by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed, right, uh, the Holy Ghost, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. And go on, we'll keep reading. Therefore, verse 36, we'll read 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know uh, assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent. Repent. He didn't say confess all your sins. Keep confessing all your sins at your remembrance. All your lifetime, keep confessing all your sins. He says, repent. That word repent. It simply means change your way of thinking. It is not by works. It's only by grace that you're saved. You've got to repent of that. Because all this while, people were thinking that they got to be, do good, see good, think of good things. And they always thought it is, salvation is only by the law. But then you've got to repent of salvation, which is not by the law. It is only by the grace of God. It is only by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the grace of God. The grace of God is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that has brought us to salvation. It's not by our works. It's not by how good we are or how we try. So repent of that theology that is in your mind, that ideology that is in your mind concerning I got to be a good person to be saved. I got to change, uh, I, got to, I got to change my lifestyle uh, and then somewhere down the line God may save me. Now, repent, come to a place where repentance is a one-time act concerning your salvation. Concerning your salvation, repentance is a one-time act. It is not repenting over and over again and losing your salvation, gaining your salvation, losing your salvation, and coming back to church one uh, for a season and you feel that you're saved and then you lost your salvation when you, at, that, at, at the next season. You have not been going to church and reading your Bible and doing things. Well, once and for all, come, come to the grips of understanding. Repentance is a one-time act concerning your salvation. You don't keep repenting over and over again. That's like being circumcised all and over and over and over again. You don't circumcise more than once. That's all. People, people in the Old Testament circumcision is a type of the, the old nature being removed. That you have a covenant with God now. Right? So they did only once. They were circumcised and they entered into the covenant with God. They don't keep entering into the covenant over and over again. But thereafter, there can be acts of repentance that we have when we, when we truly know that we have deliberately and we realize that we have made a mistake. That also should never be done with condemnation. That should be done with true confession, understanding, Lord, I confess my sin. And you are faithful and you are just to forgive all my sin. That's in 1 John 1, 9. Maybe we'll put that scripture up. Let's see that scripture. People are confused about that scripture too. They think we got to do it like the way 1 John. 1 John 1, 1 9 is not for unbelievers, it is for believers. If we confess our sins, maybe a couple of acts that we have committed that are not pleasing in the eyes of God, we confess it. Not for the sake of keep on, keep saying it over and over again, confess your sins to him. And he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Actually, it is, it is an insult to God when you, when you live in condemnation and say, I feel that I'm still not forgiven. You are calling him unfaithful and unjust. You are calling him unfaithful and unjust. If we confess once, it's, it is taken care. 
I mean, confession is not that we let God know what we have done. Confessing is to put it out of our life. That's simply what it means. I confess. We confess our sins. If we, if we, if we don't, then we are harboring bitterness in our hearts and we are carrying something that we should not be carrying. And uh, there's a possibility that, 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 that the enemy can, can uh, try to put you into condemnation and weaken your faith so that you, will, you might even fall into some uh, uh, erroneous act or probably you can even continue to keep living sick in your body or maybe some other problem. But if we confess, that confession does not mean that you keep saying it over and over, oh God, I sin, oh God, I sin, oh God, I sin. That's not what you should be confessing. That's not what you should be confessing. You know that you have made a mistake. It's a deliberate act of making an error. That confession is not the confession concerning promises that we make. When we make a confession concerning the promises of God, we believe that we are healed by the stripes of Jesus and that has nothing to do with this. This is talking about an erroneous act that we have got involved with or something that we have committed, something that wrong that we have done. Oh God, I, 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 I'm, I'm repenting of this. And the act of repentance is, Lord, I have done this. It is acknowledging and saying, Lord, I, I ask you to forgive me. I know that I missed it. Or in other words, there also is another scripture where it says, confess your faults one to another. That does not mean to keep going on talking to the brother and say, oh, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Let's go to that scripture also. Maybe we'll clarify that in James chapter 5 and verse number 17. James chapter 5 and verse 17 or we'll read verse 16 probably. Confess your faults one to another. That's not talking about all the time going to the person and say, oh, please, I made a mistake yesterday. Please forgive me. And then the next week as we meet the person, oh, please, I'm sorry, please forgive It means very clear. It's very clear. Confess your faults one to another. You made a fault against a brother or a sister. Go, forgive. Go ask for forgiveness. Confess your faults. Say, I'm sorry, I have been, I've done this. Forgive me. And pray for one another. So that, you know, you're, in, you're, you're reconciled with the person. That's why you pray for the person. You don't have any, you don't harbor any bitterness. You pray for one another. That you may be healed. Okay, in other words, there's a possibility that if you harbor any bitterness against a brother, or a, a sister, there's a possibility that you can be sick in your body. That's the reason it says that so that you may be healed. Confess your faults one to another. You might say, oh, that person is not going to accept my fault. He, she, I'm, that person is never going to forgive me. It doesn't matter. Once you spit it out of your mouth, it's not in you. That's that person's burden. If that person does not willing, is not willing to forgive you, go on with your life without hanging on. Oh, she didn't forgive me. Oh, I feel so bad. She didn't forgive me. She's not God. You have done your part. If God can forgive your sins and if she can't forgive your sins, it does not mean that you are in a mess. If she is not forg forgiving you or it means that she's living in bitterness and she's going to face the consequences. He or she is going to face the consequences, but you are free. Oh, that sister is so mad with me and she is refusing to forgive me. So what? Leave her alone and go about your life. Go about her life. Pray for her, maybe somewhere down the line or she will understand or he will understand and and, and uh, they may come back to you somewhere down the line and, and reconcile. But if you have confessed, you're freed. It's like you spit out what needs to be done and then you're free from it. And then pray for one another that you may be healed. So when you pray for one another, your, you, your healing is just there for you. The effectual prayer, prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Right, now... We are going back again to the book of Acts and chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter said, repent. 
That repent is talking about repenting a one-time act concerning your salvation. I repent of trying to earn my salvation by keeping the law. I repent of that ideology that I have and I believe in the grace of God. And I repent and I'm baptized. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus. The name that is above every other name. So we find baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. In the early church, nobody was baptized any, any, by any other name apart from the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everyone. There is no record at all of anybody being baptized in any other name or any other title. So be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, which is to take care of your sin, where you get yourself baptized and you're free now. You're free now because you're repented and you're baptized and you're free from sin and you're no longer a sinner. And then the next thing is, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in the scriptures, you could see it has always, it has been in various ways. Some people have received the gift before. They have believed in Jesus and they have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Even before the water baptism, they have, been, they have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't matter. In, it's very scriptural. If somebody gets spirit-filled or speaks in tongues, before they get baptized, it's perfectly all right. Don't condemn them. Oh, you're speaking the devil's language. You're not, you're not baptized yet. You know, we have all these tri uh, rituals we just try to introduce and we just have our own, own terminologies and the, and the church, church tries to put people in bondage. You can be saved even without being water baptized. Oh, how could that be? How could that be? Well, how did the people speak in tongues when P Peter was preaching? Okay, let's read, this. let's read the scripture. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 10. We find that Peter was preaching. While he was preaching, people started prophesying and they started speaking in tongues. And Peter said, can any man forbid them from water? So they were baptized even before, right? So Acts chapter 10. Verse 43, uh, I suppose. Acts chapter 10. Verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Because at the preaching of the word of God, faith comes. So they had so much of faith and they had so much of the word being preached about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all of a sudden they bursted out into speaking in tongues because the Holy Ghost fell on them. They just, it, you know, your faith can draw. Your faith can, when you have the word of God, you get, you're so thirsty and hungry. Yes, I believe, what next, what next? I'm waiting for the next blessing to come. Immediately, they were able to grab in to the blessing of God and they started speaking in tongues, right? And they, of the circumcision which believed, were astonished. See, everything was an experience to the early church. They were astonished. As many as came with Peter because on the Gentiles also was the Holy, was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is very scriptural for you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit if you believe in Jesus Christ, the resurrection. And if you, if, if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you start speaking in tongues, don't be afraid of it. Don't be surprised, oh my God, how could it be? Can somebody speak in tongues without even taking water baptism? How come? And God, God is God. He wants to do it his way. When he sees somebody, he, he wants to seal them. He wants to arrest them. He wants to, he wants to bless them with, because the, the word grace, one of the meanings of the word grace is the giver is more interested to give than the receiver who is interested in receiving. The giver is more, 
more enthusiastic in giving and he wants to give more than the receiver to receive. That's what grace is. He is more than willing to give than we are to receive. So anybody just opens a little bit, just like the boy who came back to the father, I always refer that story. I mean, when the boy turned his heart, the father from a distance saw and ran towards the boy. The boy should have been running towards the father. But it was the father who ran towards the boy. I mean, he covered a greater distance than the boy who was, you know, I wonder what my father would say, I'll just go and tell him that he'll receive me as a little slave and, and just let me eat something. And he had been, he, he, he's sorry. But the father ran. The father didn't want him to even change his mind and go back to the pig pen by some means. But the father ran and brought him. So we find that the gift of the Holy Ghost was poured on them. And verse 46 says, And they heard them speak with tongues. Speaking in tongues is not only for the apostles. Speaking in tongues is for we Gentiles who, had, who were godless, who were without strength, with no covenant, aliens to the commonwealth of Israel. The Holy Ghost is a gift given to us. And, and, and the circumcised, the ones who were circumcised, the Jews, they were surprised, they were astonished. How could this be? These Gentiles, these godless people, they're, they're baptized in the Holy Ghost because they believed in the word. It's just believing and receiving. They did not have to maybe put things in order in their life I, we, have, we have met so many Christians who say, God has still not baptized me with the Holy Spirit because I know I'm not still ready yet. I'm still trying to search where is the sin? What is the sin that I have committed that God can't fill me with his spirit? I'm still searching. I'm still searching. So you keep searching all your lifetime, but you cannot search. It's impossible for you to receive just because, you know, just because you think probably God will only answer me if everything is perfect in my life. Jesus is perfect, and if you're united to Jesus, you are made perfect in Christ. Colossians 2.10. You are perfect in Christ because he is your perfection. He is your righteousness. The word Jehovah, Jireh. Or the word Jehovah Sidkinu. The word Jehovah Sidkinu in the book of uh, uh, Jeremiah 23 and verse 7, I believe. It's somewhere down there. Jeremiah, we'll put that scripture up. Jeremiah 23 and verse 7. No, it's not there. Before that. Yeah. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness, Jehovah Sidkenu. That's the word there. I don't know Hebrew, but that's how we have learned and we, we have help from certain books. So I'm not here trying to brag about the little extra language that I know. I simply know that it's talking about the Lord our righteousness. Not we our righteousness, the Lord our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. We are not our righteousness, the Lord is our righteousness. We just hide behind his coat and say, I'm righteous because I received Jesus into my life. He who knew no sin became sin for me. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, he who knew no sin, but he became sin for me, that I might be the righteousness of God. He knew no sin at all, but he became sin for me, that I might be the righteousness of God. It's not my righteousness, it's his righteousness. It is a gift given to me. It's a gift given to me. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17 says, it's a gift that we have received. 
It's a gift. Thank God for the gift. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. If one man's offense, death reigned. Can't we believe that by one man's righteous act that we can receive the gift of righteousness? Much more, they which receive the abundance of grace, abundance of grace, this is an abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus. So by believing in Jesus, we become the righteousness of God. We become the, we, we, have, we have a right standing with God right now. So we thank God for the grace and the goodness of God. So we find in Acts chapter 2, repent, verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. So how do you get baptized? In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. And you might receive the, that you might receive, that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Receiving the Holy Ghost into your life is a gift. Speaking in tongues is a gift. It's a gift free of charge. Gifts are always free. And the Bible is amazing. It says the free, it says the free gift of God. I was amazed to see that because gifts are usually free. But the Bible makes it clear because some religious minds think you've got to pay for a gift. You've got to pay for a gift. But the Bible says you have been freely. It's a free gift in Romans chapter 5. Maybe we should read that. I get so excited when I read these words because these words mean a lot to me. Romans chapter 5 and verse 15 but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. You know, have you ever given a gift to somebody and said, this is a free gift? You don't say that when you give a gift. Have you ever, have you ever given a gift to somebody and said, this is a free gift? You don't say, this is a gift. But the Bible makes, the Holy Spirit is so, it makes it, it just goes through every religious mind and it say, it's a free gift to the religious people because the religious people still want to pay for, for that gift. I want to pay. I feel, when can I pay? How can I pay for what he has done? It's a free gift. It's not actually, it's not actually, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not uh, uh, I would say it's not good manners for you to go and give a gift on a birthday or some other day that you find you want to go and give. This is a free gift I give you. You never say that. You always say, this is a gift. Well, that's to the religious mind who think that they can pay for the gift. That's just one verse there. Also, so also is the free gift. Free gift. I never, I never say when I give a gift to somebody, there's a gift. I never, I've never in my life said this is a free gift. I never said it's a free gift to you. So you don't, and God wants to make it so clear that you cannot pay it and I don't want you to pay and I'm not going to receive anything of the gift that is given to you freely. Freely. It's freely given. There's also another scripture where it says in uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. That word doesn't use there as a gift, but it also says, He that spared not, not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give all things? It's all things that are given to you are given freely. It is not by our righteousness that we can earn. It's not by we being good that we try to get God's blessing. So thank God that uh, repentance is a one-time act concerning salvation. Thereafter, the faults that we make, we can always change and repent. And the word repent also simply means a change of mind. I change my way of thinking. So there can be 
an ongoing repentance in your mind. I was thinking it like this, but I repent and I'm now thinking it in another way. It does not mean to bawl and cry and keep saying, oh God, I repent, I repent. please forgive me, Lord. Repentance is, is to change your way of thinking. Change your way of thinking. But many Christians, we still find they keep repenting. Every time they keep repenting, they just want to, they just want to make sure that they are condemned, that God will be, that will be pleased by their condemnation and accept them. Oh, you are really feeling so sorry for yourself, so that's the reason I accept you. That boy, when he came back home, I always take that boy, I mean, the, Jesus, such an example, beautiful example he gave and he made it so perfect. He came with all his, all his crying and all, all his, uh, he was trying to say everything, but, but the father just embraced him and received him. Put, a, put everything into his, himself back again, everything that he was lost was restored. Didn't try to listen to what he had to say. The father was not interested. The father only saw that he came back home. His heart was to come back. But then uh, the way the father received was totally different. He wanted to become a slave, but he was still a son. So you got to get out of your slavery mentality and become a son conscious. Don't be slave conscious, but be son conscious always. And then you'll know who your father is. Many know nothing at all about who their heavenly father is because they are so slave conscious. They kind of think he's a ruler, he's a controller, he's a master. I mean, we know that he is. He's the God of everything. He is the great judge. He is, uh, he is he, he's a good, he, he's a, a perfect, he brings perfect justice. But he's also your father. That's the most important thing. So going back again. We do not frustrate the grace of God and we do not want to live in misery. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17 says, if Christ, okay, we'll read, we were reading certain scriptures there, okay. From 12 we'll read. From 12, if Christ be preached, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. Now Christ has always been preached that he is a resurrected Christ. He rose again. He died and he rose again. He died and he rose again. That's the message of the cross. The message of the cross does not end without his resurrection. You can preach the cross all your, time, all your life long by saying Jesus died for you, Jesus died for you, Jesus died for you. But if you don't preach to them that Jesus rose again, they can never become born again. They can never be justified. Because what Jesus accomplished, the message of the cross is death, burial, and resurrection. That's what he says in verse chapter 15. Chapter 15 and verse number 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that I also, which I also received that how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, it didn't stop there, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. Verse 3 and verse 4, it doesn't stop in verse 4. He died for our sins and he was buried and he was resurrected. That's the message of the cross in full. It's not just partial. When you, when you preach that Jesus died for you on the cross, then you're still keeping that man on the cross. But you've got to get him crucified, get him water baptized, and let him rise up and know that he is a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new in his life. He's no longer the old. He's a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. That's the message of the cross, to bring that person into the full knowledge. People, lots of people know that Jesus died on the cross. Oh yeah, there was a good man called Jesus who died on the cross, but they don't believe. That's the reason your salvation is based on his resurrection. He, you got to believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You got to believe that the same Lord who was crucified was also resurrected from the dead. 
And that brings salvation into your life according to Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. So 1 John 1 9, we have seen it. And now we go back again to the book of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ, uh, then is Christ risen, uh, then is Christ not risen? <clears throat> if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Which means, if one who believes that Jesus died for them and he rose again on the third day, and if they don't believe in that, if they don't believe in that, then there is no resurrection. If there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is, if Christ did not rise, if Christ did not rise, then none of us are resurrected. None of us are resurrected if Christ did not rise. Because Christ rose again, that we are all resurrected. We are not hanging on the cross with our sins. We are not dead with sin, but we are alive. We are alive now, right? We are alive. We are living a resurrected life. So if, if there is no resurrection, resurrection is... I explained to you, as I explained to you earlier, that when we die physically, we are, we are in the presence of the Lord and we are resurrected. That's one resurrection. And the, and the most important thing for us to understand resurrection concerning this life, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, our old nature dies and we are buried and we are resurrected as new creatures in Christ Jesus. That's the resurrected life that we're living. We are living a resurrected life. Okay, hold on to this scripture. Let's go to the book of Romans. Romans. I'm pulling these scriptures out because something that is very important. Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six, because resurrection, resurrection of Christ for this present time to us would mean nothing if we are not living a resurrected life or if we are not really enjoying the resurrected life. Well, we know we believe in Jesus and we have been born into the family of God and after our physical death that we would see him face to face. We know that. But then what about the resurrected life that we are supposed to live here on earth? Right? In Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. We are buried with him. Remember, we are put together with him. We are planted together with him. That in the likeness, that, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of life. Put that into your brain, into your heart, into your mind. Even so, we also should walk, 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 not after our death, walk, living on earth. It's talking about that work, walk, and understand living on earth, living this life here on earth. Even so, we should walk in the newness of life. Or in other words, to live a resurrected life. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. So are you and I who believed in Jesus Christ are raised up to be walking this resurrected life in the newness. To walk this new life, totally different this new life is not referring to living the old defeated life. It's talking about living a life that is pleasing unto the Father and living for the glory of God. And even as we walk the walk of victory, even so, also should we not living in frustration. That's, 
frustrate in the grace of God. That's what I read earlier in Galatians 5, uh, Galatians 3 and verse uh, 21. We don't frustrate the grace of God. We don't want to live a frustrated life. We want to live the life that is pleasing unto God and enjoying the victories that Christ has for us. So walking in the newness of life, verse 5, it qualifies, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, do you know something? You and I were crucified with him. Because it says here, if, if he's always talking about get onto the believing side, if we have been planted together, if you believe, if you really believe, getting on, getting on to the side of believing, not think, I wonder. No, I believe. So if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, if we believe that our old nature was crucified, planted together, we were planted together of his death, in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. What is the likeness of his resurrection? Walking in the newness of life. As much as the Father was, uh, as much as Jesus was raised uh, by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. So the newness of life and the resurrected life is referring to the life that we are living here on earth. Not after death, not after our physical death, to live here on earth, the glory, living, to the, living to the, for the glory of God. Verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Your old man is crucified. Your old nature your old nature, not when you get old, you call that. It's talking about your old nature. That's your old nature. Your old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Henceforth, we should not serve sin. Henceforth, we should not serve. We're not slaves to serving sin, which means we can living the resurrected life, to live in the resurrected life. All the time serving sins. You're no longer serving sin. But if you read that scripture continuously up to verse 14, you will see how we need to use our instruments of our body, as members of our body, for the, as an instrument uh, of righteousness, not of unrighteousness. Okay, we're going to close with 1 Corinthians 15 because we don't want to live no longer a frustrated life. All the time living in anxiety and worry and fear and double-mindedness and living a life that is not stable in Christ, up and down and uh, swayed all over. That's not the way that Christ wants us to live. He wants us to live stable concerning our resurrected life. Right? So verse 13 says, If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then... Is our preaching vain, and you are, and your faith, and your faith is also vain. Preaching is vain. Allah, our, our faith is in vain if Christ has not risen. Because He has risen, we are also risen, and we are living a resurrected life. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God because we have. Testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. We'll continue to keep reading. If the dead rise not then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and you're yet in your sins. See, all this, is, all this has to do with the resurrection of Christ where we identify ourselves with living the newness of life, living a resurrected life. We living this resurrected life. So we are, our faith is in vain and our, 
uh, uh, we are still in our sins, but we are not in our sins and our faith is not in vain because Christ rose again and we live by faith and we are the righteousness of God. We are not sinners, right? Don't call yourself a sinner. People might say, oh, we are all sinners. You say, not me. I'm born into the family of God. I'm born. Oh, you mean to say you never sin? You don't, you don't become a sinner just because you may make a sin. You may have to confess and you've got to forsake it. That's all. You don't have to continue to keep believing, oh, we are sinners. We make mistakes continuously. Well, if you're a sinner, get saved. Then you can call yourself the righteousness of God. Either you're a sinner or the, all the righteousness of God, one of the two. We're still not in our sins, thank God. We are saved. Verse 18 says, okay, we'll read, we'll read from verse 18, yeah. Then they which, they also which are fallen asleep, now it's talking about people who are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. All this was, before this was all talking about our resurrected life. Now it's saying, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So if Christ did not rise, then we are the most miserable person. That's what the next verse says. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are most, we are all most miserable. If Christ did not rise again, then we are the most miserable people. The whole subject here, people, people take this scripture. I was also having questions about this, but when I read, if you take it out of context, you will always think, well, we are, we are the most, people can take this scripture out of context and say, we are of all most miserable. We Christians are the most miserable people. We are the most miserable people. That's the reason you find a lot of miserable, peop- miserable Christians walking in darkness, walking in fear, walking in anxiety, walking in frustration, walking with no hope at all. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, it's concerning those who do not believe in resurrection. If, this, if our belief system is wrong, then we are the most miserable people. But we are not the most miserable people. We are not frustrating the grace of God. We are not the frustrated group of people. We are not the people who are living in anxiety and worry. We are a people who are living the resurrected life. We are living the resurrected life. If you're living the resurrected life, then you are not a miserable character. If you're not living, if you're not living the resurrected life, you may be the miserable character because not knowing the truth. Although, even though you are saved. Thank God, the grace of God. Thank God that we are risen from the dead. We have no no doubt at all about his resurrection. That's the reason we are living a resurrected life. We are not only having hope about this life that people are talking about, oh, we are the most miserable people. Oh, I have no, I'm not very sure about my salvation. I'm not sure if I'm forgiven. I'm not sure if I'm a new creation. Get born again. Simple as that. Get born again. You don't have to live in misery. You know, people who are living double-minded are the most miserable people. One day they believe they are saved, the other day they believe that they are not saved. One day they believe that they are born into the family of God, the next day they believe that they are devil's kids. Well, how can that person live the joyful life, they are the most miserable people because they live according to the sermons that they hear. They live according to what their belief system says. Once and for all, come to a place where you understand repentance is once and for all concerning your salvation and you have altogether repented from believing that you can try to please God by living according to the law and you have jumped onto God's side of grace by saying, Jesus, grace and truth has come by Jesus and I receive him Lord of my life. And I'm, I'm the righteousness of God and I live the resurrected life. And I'm not the miserable person. You want to find a miserable person, you have found the wrong person. Out comes out of my mouth only the joy of the Lord. My tongue is the tree of life. I speak life, I speak peace, I speak joy. 
you are not talking to a miserable character you are talking to a person who is living the resurrected life the person who is living the newness of life you are not living the we are not living according to the oldness of the letter but we are living in the newness of the spirit not according to the oldness of the letter which only kills but i live according to the spirit we are all able ministers of the new testament not of the letter but of the spirit of the spirit you are different second corinthians 3 and verse 6 says you are able ministers you are able ministers that's how it goes who also are made us able ministers of the new testament not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter killeth and the spirit giveth life if you try to please god by the old testament by trying to earn god's blessings then you're living a, a a life that is killing you but you can live the life of jesus which is the newness of the spirit right so it says talking about the living but living the spirit uh living according to the spirit of god another scripture you can put up in uh, romans chapter 7 and verse 4 romans chapter 7 and verse 5 i suppose we have four brethren um the next verse eight Ah, yeah, that's right. Six. But now we are delivered from the law. You're delivered from trying to please God by your good works. We have been delivered from it. That being dead, there, wherein we are, we have, we uh, were held. That we should serve in the newness of the spirit. that we should serve the lord in the newness of the spirit walking in the spirit and not of the oldness of the letter or of the trying to live by the 10 commandments if anybody tries to live by the 10 commandments then you will find it so oh yeah you mean to say you're despising the 10 com- i don't despise the 10 commandments at all we're living in a higher law a greater law by which christ has fulfilled and he lives in us and now he gives us the ability that we should be able to live the life of freedom thank god for his grace so that sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under the law but you are under grace so grace gives you the ability to live the glorious life the resurrected life heavenly father we thank you for the grace of god for the love of god for the fellowship of the holy spirit for the goodness of god for the mighty presence of the holy one we thank you that we are no longer living according to the oldness of the letter but of the newness of the spirit the resurrected life that we're living right now we thank you for the grace the love the favor the goodness the mercies that we see all the days of our life we're no longer going to live in frustration no longer living in misery but we're living the glorious life of Jesus thank you lord for saving us in the way that you thought it right to save us not by we planning up this plan of salvation but it was your plan of salvation for us everyone they have their own plans of trying to get, get themselves saved but you have only one plan that we believe with our heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead confess lord jesus confess lord jesus and your plan is the best the best plan and it works very well you said repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ so that you will receive the gift of the holy spirit that's the plan of god the plan of man is still trying to save themselves the plan of god is by the preaching of the cross and the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish but to them who believe it is the power of god unto salvation 
Heavenly Father, I pray for every person, every viewer right now in their miserable state of living. I pray that they will be transformed completely. That there will be no longer misery in their hearts. But they would say, yes, now I know that I should be living a resurrected life. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that they would say, Jesus, come into our lives. I receive Jesus, Lord. And believe in the name of the Son of God. That they can be saved. You said to them that received him, that they, you gave them the power to become sons of God, even to those who believe in your name. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, salvation is near unto them, even in their heart and even in their mouth. Or in their mouth and then in their heart. That they would confess, Lord Jesus, and they would believe in their heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And from that day forth, they could live the resurrected life. I pray for your guidance for each person in Jesus' name. Amen.